Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about an extremely practical problem in data science, specifically classification problems called unbalanced data. Now it's pretty easy to understand this problem. So unbalanced data is any time where the different classes you have in your classification problem have very different proportions in the data. For example, let's keep things simple today and just talk about binary classification problems. So either it's true or false, one or zero. So unbalanced data happens in a problem, for example, you're trying to predict if a aircraft engine is going to fail. Very few aircraft engines fail, thankfully. And so the number of positive examples you're going to have in your data is going to be far, far fewer than the number of negative examples you have in your data. You can think of many, many more cases like this. Credit card fraud, for example, most credit card transactions are valid. And so the number of fraudulent transactions is very, very small. But that is exactly the case, the class, that you're trying to predict. And so when you have data like this, which is very unbalanced, and I would argue most interesting classification problems are unbalanced by design. When you have this case, a lot of things can go wrong in your machine learning models. When I was thinking about how to structure this video, I was initially going to do a whiteboard video on a survey of different machine learning models and what can theoretically go wrong with them when you have unbalanced data. But I decided to instead just focus on one machine learning model, decision trees, for this video and instead make it a coding video so that way you have some code and more importantly you can see the practical applications of this unbalanced data and how to fix it. So let's get into it here. This code will be of course available to you and I'll be going through the high level steps. The, uh, one of the main things is that you can change this mode between generate and read. If it's generate, it'll be generating some simulated data which is the first thing we'll do. If you change it to read, it'll read from a uh, UCI diabetes data set so we'll see how it performs on real world data as well at the end of this video. So the first thing we do is the generated data and we go ahead and print out the fraction of positive labels in the data and it's 0.71%. I want to be, I want to emphasize this, it's not 71%. The number of positive examples in this data, so the examples with class equals 1, is 0.71%, less than 1%. So this is an extremely imbalanced data set. Let's see what happens if we just train a decision tree blindly, don't even care about this imbalancedness at all. If we do that, we get the following results on the testing data. So the left side is the precision on each class, which is basically answering the question about of all the examples that I predicted to be class zero, or of all the examples that I predicted to be class one, what fraction of them did I actually get correct? And we see for class zero, the answer is 99%. We're doing great. But for class one, it's only 12%. Not doing good at all. The right-hand plot is recall, so this is asking a related but different question, which is of all the examples that were truly class 0, or of all the examples that were truly in class 1, what fraction of them did I correctly catch during my testing? And for class 0, again, we get 99%, but for class 1, we get only 17%. This is clearly going to be a problem if your use case is truly trying to predict aircraft engine failure or fraudulent credit card transactions. You don't want to only get 17% of those. You want to do much better. And so the reason this is happening, so we'll go through three solutions um, and we'll talk about all of them, but let's talk a little bit about the intuition about why this is happening. If you think about your data set, it's mostly made up of these examples of class zero, only a very few of them are class one. And so when you feed this data into really any basic classification technique and you don't tell it any extra information, of course it's going to prioritize the majority class because it's going to get most of its metrics, most of the weight on the decision metric, the evaluation metric it's using is going to come from this big majority class of data. So it's, of course it's not going to care about the minority class at all. But that leads to very poor performance on the minority class. So we need to take some active steps if we want to change this outcome. And solution one is a very intuitive solution, maybe the most intuitive, and it is to upweight the minority class. So many machine learning models, decision trees included, are able to take in some additional parameters which tell it how much weight to put on each of the different classes and if we pass in the correct values for those parameters, we should get better results on our minority class and hopefully not sacrifice too much or anything on the majority class. And so we get the weight simply by dividing the number of examples in our data, which are of class zero, by the number of examples in our data, which are of class one, and that gives us a weight of around 140. What that says intuitively is that when the model is training, if it's putting a weight of one on all these majority class zero examples, it should put a weight of 140 times that on each of these minority class examples. This counteracts the fact that there are fewer of them. So even though there are fewer of them, they become much more important to the model 
and hopefully now it's going to get better evaluation metrics. So when we go ahead and do that, and we pass in that into the decision tree, we get these results. So I'll put on the uh, original results at the top of the screen, so I don't have to keep scrolling up, but I'll scroll up once. Before we were getting 0.12 and 0.17. Now we're getting 0.26 and 0.23, which is much, much better. And importantly, we haven't sacrificed anything on the majority class. In fact, it looks like we actually got 100%. So we're doing pretty much the same on the majority class, and we're doing tons better on the minority class already, just with the simple fix. Let's see if we can get even better. So another class of solutions is to oversample the minority class. So part of the problem, as we said, is that we have this giant data set, and only a little part of it is this minority class. So what if we construct a new data set where the classes are equally represented. So to be explicit, the new data set, let's say, is the same size as the original data set. It's just that we are going to sample these minority examples with a much higher weight than the majority examples. So that at the end of the day, this new data set is actually 50-50. And if we do that, so I'm just put some comments here. Basically, we get the indices of each class. We get the weights for each class, the weight being what is the probability of sampling from that. And obviously that's going to be higher for the minority class. And then we sample the new indices. We see that the fraction of positive labels in the oversampled data is 50%. So we've achieved this goal of creating an oversampled new data set where now it's 50-50. And now we just plug this into our decision tree as normal. And we see now we get a precision on class 1 of 20% here. And our recall has gone up to 42%. So before it was 26. So we actually did a little bit worse on precision than the reweighting but we did a lot better on a recall. And these trade-offs are gonna be normal, but the key thing to note is that it's doing better on both precision and recall than doing nothing at all. So this is better than doing nothing at all. Now let's talk about the final technique in this video. I've called it solution 2A because it's extremely related to this oversampling technique. It just fixes a possible deficiency in the oversampling we just did. If you think about the oversampling we just did, there's very few positive examples in the data set. And by basically randomly sampling them to create a bunch more, we are artificially reducing the variation in our data. What that means that a lot of our rows in this oversampled data are going to be exactly the same. So we have this method called SMOT, very nice funny name, but it stands for Synthetic Minority Oversampling Technique, which is just a big fancy way of saying that instead of just taking the raw features from all of these class one examples, we are actually going to combine pairs of class one examples together with some random proportion. So maybe I'll flash a picture on the screen to make it a little bit easier for you, but basically what we're gonna do is anytime we're gonna sample from the minority class, we're gonna take one minority example randomly, take another minority example randomly, combine them in some random proportion to get a synthetic sample. That's where the synthetic comes from. And we're hoping that this is going to not artificially reduce the variation in the data set and be more generalizable on the test data. And so you can read through all the comments here. I won't go through it in too much detail, but you can see this random proportion being generated and you can see the new synthetic sample being created in this line here. When we do that, we see that the fraction of positive labels is the same, 50%, that hasn't changed. But what has changed is that without this SMOT method in the naive oversampling, we only have 71 distinct values if we're looking at only class one examples but now we have 4947 so we're introducing a lot more variation in this minority class back into the data set synthetically and now we look at these same plots we see that our precision is 12 percent we've actually suffered a lot on precision so that's interesting but our recall is the highest it's been for any of these models before so there's all these trade-offs but the fact is again we're doing better than doing nothing so none of these solutions is the answer they're just different ways to go about it. At the end of the day, you want to see what happens on your test data and go from there. And the last thing we'll do today is go through all these same steps, but we'll look at some real data, some a diabetes data set, so trying to predict diabetes, I believe. So we're going to go ahead and change this to read and run all these cells again. Bam, 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 bam. Let's start at the top and see what we got. So this is not nearly as imbalanced. There's 36% positive, so it's a little bit imbalanced, but let's see if we can do any better by changing what we do here. So we see the precision on class one is 51%, definitely lower than the majority class, and the recall is 60%. So we're trying to beat about 50 and 60 in precision and recall, respectively. If we do the re-weighting, up-weighting the minority class, we get 57 and 58, so we're doing better on precision, and a little bit worse on recall, maybe the same. 
If we do the oversampling of the minority class, we get 52, a little bit better, 63, a little bit better there. If we do smote, we get 49, so a little bit worse, maybe the same on precision. We got a huge jump in recall though, we got 70%. But the one thing I will say here is that our recall in class zero did go down from doing nothing. So there is a little bit more work to be done here on real data sets. But hopefully you saw um, how you can deal with unbalanced data, the different methods you can use, and usually doing something to deal with it is better than doing nothing at all. And that might be the make or break between having a bad model and something that's actually viable. So hopefully you learned something in this video. If you did, please, please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. It really helps get this message out there to everybody. So thanks for sticking through this video until the end, and I will see you next time.